Member for Mirabuka. Madam Speaker. Madam Acting Speaker. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. Uh, can I add uh, to the others that in this House have congratulated Madam Speaker for her election as the first female Speaker of this House? And can I also congratulate the Premier and can I congratulate all the members who have been elected to this Parliament, especially those who, like me, are here for the first time? I would like to begin by acknowledging the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, the traditional owners on whose country we meet. I acknowledge their continuing connection to the land and pay my deep respects to their elders past and present. First and foremost, can I thank the good people of Mirabuka for the faith that they have shown in electing me as the member for Mirabuka. It is a great privilege to be here and I promise I will work hard for you and I will do my best for you. I would like to acknowledge the former member for Mirabuka, Janine Freeman, and thank her for her passionate advocacy for our community over the last 12 years. She's worked tirelessly for the people of Mirabuka and she has an abiding affection for our community. In return, she is much loved by people in the electorate, as they have reminded me almost daily <laughs> since I was pre-selected as the Labor candidate. I am very grateful to Janine for her friendship and for her generous support, and I am aware I have big shoes to fill as I seek to follow in her footsteps. I need to also acknowledge you, Acting Madam Speaker, as the member for Lansdale, who up until this election has represented the suburbs of Girraween and Marangaroo. These people have also been quick to tell me that the member for Lansdale has been a committed, hard-working local member for them for more than 20 years, and they, quite rightly, expect nothing less from me. While campaigning, I regularly assured people that I will work hard to live up to the high standard that both Janine and Margaret have set and I reconfirm that promise to the good people of Mirabuka today. On the wall in my office hangs a letter written in 1954 by the then Under Secretary of Lands, which tells us that Mirabuka is named for the Southern Cross. However, the well known Aboriginal poet Ujuru Nuakal, or Kath Walker, as she's been also known, tells the story in more detail in her book, Stradbroke Dreamtime. She tells the story of Bayami, the good spirit in the sky, who was extremely busy guarding the Aboriginal people and found he could not watch them all the time. He decided he needed the assistance of someone to help him care for and protect his people. He chose a man named Mirabuka, who was wise and much loved by his people for the way he cared for the welfare of his tribe. She writes, Bayami gave him a spirit form and placed him in the sky amongst the stars. He gave Mirabuka lights for his hands and feet and stretched him across the sky so that he could watch forever over the tribes he loved. And the tribes could look up to him from the earth and see the stars, which were Mirabuka's eyes, gazing down on them. The electorate of Mirabuka comprises the suburbs of Balga, Mirabuka, Kundula, Girraween, Marangaroo and part of Dianella. It is one of the most ethnically diverse electorates in the state. Many Aboriginal Australians call Mirabuka home with a continuous connection to the land stretching back tens of thousands of years. The area was considered a rich source of food for Aboriginal people for thousands of years. And in the same way that the Mirabuka of Aboriginal legend cared for and protected the Aboriginal people, so too the electorate of Mirabuka provides refuge for those who come from around the world to settle in its suburbs. For those who are new arrivals, some people have come as migrants and others have come as refugees, having left political, social and economic upheaval in their home country. Around half of all people in the electorate were born overseas and around half speak a language other than English while at home. The largest group, outside those with Australian or English backgrounds, are people who have come from Vietnam, followed by Burmese people from Myanmar and those of Indian descent. I am fortunate to have recently been a part of many joyful community gatherings, such as the Kachin Harvest Festival, the Karen and Chin New Year celebrations and the Laurie Festival. It was a great pleasure to join with the Vietnamese community for their Tet celebrations, welcoming the Vietnamese New Year at the Girraween High School Oval in March. The vibrant community celebration brought crowds and festivity, culture, dancing and amazing food to the heart of our community. 
Representing the people of Mirabuka has also brought me closer to world events, as local constituents regularly speak with me about social and political upheaval being experienced by friends and family in their country of origin. Many have reflected on how fortunate we are to live in WA during the global pandemic that has wrought havoc on the health and economic welfare of so many people around the world. The contrast between our experience in WA and how other parts of the world have fared during the pandemic is stark. Quite rightly, people have praised the leadership of the McGowan Labor government in keeping our community safe during these most challenging of times. They have expressed their gratitude for our amazing healthcare workers and a public health system that's responded so capably to the challenge of keeping us safe during these past 12 months. Reverberation from global upheaval touched the lives of my constituents every day. The Burmese people in Mirabuka have been deeply impacted since the military seized control of Myanmar on 1st of February this year. Many civilians in Myanmar have lost their lives in the violence that has followed. These are not just events happening in some country far away, but rather there is a deep and daily impact on my constituents who have been so distressed to witness the loss of life and the loss of democracy. People in Mirabuka share a deep sense of community, a deep sense of pride in our area. It is a community that is resilient and knows the importance of standing alongside one another. Everywhere I go in Mirabuka, there are many excellent examples of collaboration and cooperation. The state and local governments, community groups, religious organisations, sporting organisations and businesses are finding ways to collaborate and bring people together. They are finding ways to build strong bonds of community and ways to improve the lives of the people who live there. The Balga Senior High School collaborates with Wajuk Northside Aboriginal Corporation to help young Aboriginal people grow into valued cultural leaders. At the Mirabuka Markets, the Mirabuka Square collaborates with Mercy Care to create a community market that helps small, mostly home-based businesses grow into retail outlets. State and local governments work with newly arrived migrants to provide them with mentoring and training and that will help them find professional and skilled work. Soccer clubs and football teams are formed to bring young people together to learn about teamwork, leadership and discipline. The Knowledge and Healing Centre, a one-stop shop for people experiencing domestic violence, is an excellent example of how collaboration and connectedness is making our community resilient and achieving better lives for people in the area. These collaborations demonstrate that Mirabuka is built on mutual respect. While there is diversity, there is not division. There is a great appreciation among the people of Mirabuka that the best way to improve our economic and social circumstances is by working together, building strong relationships and by standing in solidarity with each other. I learned a lot about community growing up in small country towns in the great southern region. I learned a lot about solidarity, although we don't call it that where I come from. I come from a long line of resourceful and hard-working country people. As a young man, my maternal grandfather, Don Hill, built a shack from corrugated iron near Travellers Lake in New South Wales. He then lived in that shack and called it home while he worked to transform the saltbush scrub around it into a sheep station. When my dad's father died at age 49, my grandmother, Patricia Hammett, carried on running their sheep station, also in the west of New South Wales, while she had two young daughters of primary school age still at home. This part of Australia is vast and remote, and at the time it lacked communication and services. When going to town meant several hours of slow car travel over sand dunes, opening and closing gates along the way, it made sense that neighbours looked out for one another and helped each other through the best and worst of times. My parents, Andrew and Leslie, arrived in Western Australia in 1963. They had just married and they moved to this great state in search of opportunity and land. They packed up a VW Beetle with all their worldly belongings and made their way to WA. They arrived just days before Christmas and celebrated their first Christmas in WA with tinned peaches and tinned ham eaten on wooden crates as they had arrived here with neither furniture nor funds to do any more. My dad worked as a farmhand in Broom Hill and my mum as a midwife. At the same time, my dad secured his own property on newly released land north of Jaramungarup. 
For the first part of my childhood, he worked as a farmhand at Broom Hill during the week and then spent almost every weekend working the block in Jerramunga up, clearing, fencing and turning the sand and scrub land into viable farmland. Through their example, my parents taught me a great deal about hard work. They also taught me the importance of looking out for your neighbours and making sure that nobody gets left behind. They taught me about the importance of community and that we all have a responsibility to contribute to building something better. These values have stayed with me throughout my working life and they will continue to guide my work in this parliament. I started school at the Broomhill Primary School, a small school with about 60 students and only three classrooms. I later attended Cojanup District High School and then completed year 11 and 12 at Governor Stirling Senior High School in Midland. I am very proud of my public school education. Our public schools consistently deliver excellent education outcomes and transform the lives of young people. Although Broomhill Primary School was a small school, the quality of our teachers, education assistants and other staff was excellent. I received an outstanding education from all the schools I attended. And so I take this opportunity to thank all those who work in our public schools and particularly to thank those teachers who particularly contributed to my education and my progress to this place. Like many young people, while I was at university, I supported myself financially with a number of casual jobs in hospitality and the fast food industries. Because I couldn't live at home, these were jobs that I relied on to pay the rent and buy food. It was these casual jobs that made me a unionist, as I discovered, like many young people experience even today, that it was all too common to be underpaid and unfairly treated. By the age of 18, I knew enough about work and the law to know that what I was experiencing wasn't fair and it wasn't legal. I was also smart enough to know that if I raised my concerns with my boss, that as a casual worker, it would only lead to my hours getting cut or losing my job altogether, rather than any improvement in my circumstances. While laws that protect workers are important, it became clear to me at this time that laws on their own aren't enough to give working people protection from a bad boss or equal power with their employers. It is only unions that do that. And so it was that when I started my first job after finishing university, I immediately joined the union. I found in the union movement many of the same values of community, solidarity, making sure no one gets left behind that I'd learned while growing up. I am indebted to former leaders at the Australian Services Union who took a chance by employing me in a full-time role when I was young and inexperienced. I've tried to repay this debt where I can to young people who I meet who are just starting out in their careers by offering support, encouragement and opportunities when I can. I spent over 17 years at the ASU, including a period of time as Assistant Branch Secretary. I was elected as the President of Unions WA in 2008 and then elected as Secretary in 2012 when the Honourable Simone McGurk left Unions WA to campaign for that state election. I am particularly grateful to her for the straight talk and advice she gave me at this time, without which I may never have accepted the opportunity that was presented to me. I also recall that when I started at the ASU, I was the first woman to be employed to organise the mainly male union members in the energy industry. And at the time, she was an official with the AMWU and was a valuable role model for me, providing me with an example of how a young or a youngish woman in her 20s might organise workers in a male dominated industry. I'm indebted to her for a great deal of wise counsel, assistance and friendship over the years we've known each other. It was a great privilege to represent working people of this state and I want to thank union members of WA for giving me that honour. Overwhelmingly union members are people who understand what it means to ensure that no one is left behind. They understand solidarity. That is standing side by side with one another, offering strength and support, not judging and not condescending. Union members are people who care not just about themselves, but about others in their workplaces, their industries and the broader community. They understand that our society and our economy are strongest when we focus on our collective wellbeing instead of just focusing on delivering benefits for the few. I became a Labor Party member because of the union movement. It was the union movement that made me active and politicised me. 
It was the union movement that taught me, particularly during the campaign against the Howard government's work choices legislation, that we need governments that are prepared to fight for a fair go for everyday working people, that in particular we need Labor governments. My experiences in life have shown me that a fair go and a good job can't be taken for granted. As Secretary of Unions WA, I have stood up for WA workplaces to be fair, equitable and safe. I have fought for a fair go for everyday working people and I intend to carry on that work. Good, well-paid jobs are an important way that we can build a society where nobody is left behind. For most of us, a good, secure job is the cornerstone to being able to live a good life. A good job provides the income, the security, the peace of mind that allows us to buy a house, have a family and enjoy family time on weekends. I am proud to be a part of a government that has a comprehensive plan to create good jobs for everyday working people. Supporting local manufacturing and having a long-term plan to make things here in WA will diversify our economy and give us access to well-paid, highly skilled jobs of the future. By making it easier and more affordable for people to go to TAFE and access vocational training will help people get skilled jobs. Investing in critical infrastructure like Metronet will create jobs and also make public transport accessible and affordable for everyday people. Having a strong safety net of public services like schools, hospitals and other services gives everyone a fair start in life and support when they need it most regardless of how much they earn or where they live. We should also ensure that so-called women's work is properly recognised and properly paid. Many women in my electorate work in aged care, health and community services, retail and other service industries. We need to take steps so that the occupations and industries that predominantly employ women do not continue to undervalue them for their skill and for their contribution to the economy. I applaud the work of unions, the United Workers Union, the Australian Services Union towards addressing the structural issues that are contributing to the gender pay gap. Madam Deputy Speaker, may I seek an expansion of time? Thank you. We live in a moment of great opportunity, an opportunity to create the secure, well-paid jobs that we need for WA's future, jobs that will build both a prosperous economy and a fair and inclusive society. I want to be part of making sure that everyday people get what they need to live good lives. And I want to be part of the debate about how we share around the wealth of this great state to make sure that everybody gets a fair go. There have been a great many people that have supported and encouraged me along the way. It is impossible to mention them all by name. Many union members, delegates and union leaders have provided me with so much sensible advice, encouragement and friendship over my 25 years in the union movement. I'd like to particularly thank today Carolyn Smith, Wayne Wood, Steve McCartney, John Phillips, Pat Byrne, Ricky Hendon, Peter O'Keefe and Mick Buchan. Some of those people are here and I want to also um, thank them for being able to endure yet another speech uh, from me. They've certainly endured enough over the last eight years. To Owen Whittle, who follows me as secretary, and to all of the wonderful people who worked at Unions WA during my time there, thank you for your friendship and all that you do for the working people of WA. Unions WA is a special place to work and you have an incredibly important role to play in the debates that will shape the future of our state. I wish you well in all that you do. Thank you to the people who worked so hard on my campaign and kept me diligently working to the plan, especially the ever fabulous Izzy MacDonald and Amy Blitvich, both of who came early and stayed until the end. Thank you also to Catherine, Sue, Donata, Hiba and Carly, who are an important part of the team. And my great thanks to the members of the Nolamara branch and the many, many other volunteers from the community, from the Labor Party and from the union movement who joined our campaign because they believed in what we were doing. I'm particularly grateful to Ibrahim, Emmanuel, Dave and Larice, Robert, Hussain, Levete and Kayundo. 
As always, the final word, the greatest thanks, must go to my family. To my husband, Matthew, my two sons, Adam and Jeremy, to my mum and dad, my brother, Steve, and his partner, Monica. Thank you all for your love and support, without which none of this would have been possible. I know I can rely on you to keep me grounded, and I know you will ensure that I never become too big for my boots. <laughs> Let me say in conclusion that it is a great honour to be here as the member for Mirabuka. However, the point is not just to be here to enjoy the fine debate in this chamber. What matters is to build something better during the time that we have here. Like my grandfather, who built a sheep station from a corrugated iron shack in the far west of New South Wales, all the migrants and refugees who settle in Mirabuka to make a better life for themselves and their families. We all bear a responsibility to build something better for the generations of West Australians who will come after us. It is an opportunity to build a better life for individuals, a more prosperous economy and a fairer and a more inclusive society. I will work hard to achieve these things for the people of Mirabuka. And during my time in this place, I'll hold in my heart and in my head the story of the original Mirabuka, who so loved his tribe, he was raised up to care for and to protect them. Thank you.